Greetings, you've landed at the VUC, IP Communications and VoIP Community. We would like to thank Simwood.com for their support. Simwood can turn you as a developer into a telco. Our hosted PBX is from OnSIP.com. You can go to GetOnSIP.com for a URL people can click to call you. We've been privileged over the last five years to be using the best conference bridge on the planet. Yes, I'm talking about ZipDX.com, full-color, full-featured, full-HD conference bridge. Our website, VUC.me on the web, is hosted by Bluehost.com. And our worldwide local rate dial-ins are from Voxbone.com. All right, everybody, welcome. It's VUC 590 for April 22nd, 2016. I'm going to let Michael take over just as soon as we remind you, be sure to go to Berlin, May 18th to 20th. Will half of us, if not, oh, 66% of us, will be there. It's going to be a fun time. It always is. Come out of your world in Berlin. Uh, that would be camailio.org and follow the breadcrumbs. Okay? Michael, it's on you, my friend. Take it away. All right. Well, um, before we get into this, I have a little story. Um, because today's guest is, is uh, Kevin Leach from InQuality. But, but before we get on to that, I want to tell you how I came to experience or not experience ISDN. Uh, I was working in the broadcast space. But I'm not voice talent. In fact, I despise the sound of my own voice. Um, but I was living in a little town near Kingston, Ontario in the early 90s, and I contacted Bell Canada because back then dial-up modems were the thing, and ISDN was what passed for broadband. And I tried to order an ISDN circuit from Bell Canada. And they basically couldn't spell ISDN. Or, to be more formal, they said, we have no tariff for that, which meant that they couldn't find a way to sell it to me. Now, remember, an ISDN circuit is 128 kilobits, two voice channels, digital voice channels, and a little channel to set it up. Um, and ever since then, I just thought, oh, telco's bad, VoIP, good. Um, and I remained in the broadcast space for another 20 years until relatively recently. So, we all know ISDN are dinosaurs and they're going away and uh, which brings us to Kevin Leach who comes from the radio world and Randy um, well Kevin thank you for joining us and tell us something about your background because we always want to ask people sort of how did they get started in technology what you know what was it that drew you into this game and then Hi, we'll get guys. on to the company Indeed. Well, well, hi, and well, thank you for the invitation to uh, appear with you today. It's uh, a pleasure to be here. Uh, my background, you know, I, I also worked in the broadcast space, uh, as you say. Um, in uh, the UK here, I, I was a radio DJ once, but that didn't last long. And then I became more of a, a radio sound operator for the BBC. Um, and I kind of, yeah, I drifted into that, really, because I've always had a, 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 certainly a, a geek side to me. Um, so, I, so I did that uh, working on... Uh, the BBC World Service and BBC Radio 4 and BBC 5 Live, which are our domestic talk stations here in the UK, uh, in, their, in their studios, kind of on a day-to-day -day basis, moving faders and uh, trying our best to, or, or trying to get people on air from various locations around the world in the best quality, which, as you can imagine, uh, sometimes goes well, sometimes it goes not so well, depending on where they are and whether uh, technology is on your side. Um, so I became more and more interested in uh, yeah, well, the communications technology in general, I suppose, during my time in that job. And the, uh, knowledge in, in the, this area continues to grow on a daily basis, but I'm, uh, I'm certainly a, a far a, a, a way off being an expert yet. Excellent, excellent. And um, so from a, you come from then the operations side, uh, which is novel because, I mean, we deal with a lot of technologists and we deal with some marketing types. But um, operationally, I mean, running 
running a network, running a business, these are, are things that are sort of near and dear to everybody here and many of the people listening. Um, so what's the origins of, of uh, inequality media? What Go back to the when the company was founded and what your ideas were and, and how that came about. Yeah, it, it was and I mean still is a tiny startup. Um, we've grown in terms of our product, but it, we're still a, a tiny, you know, garage operation, if you like. Uh, yeah, two, two guys in their garages is how my colleague Thomas uh, refers to us. And uh, it, it started out of a necessity, really. I was still working for the BBC and I had... Um, well, it was it was a pilot project, I suppose, an idea uh, when I was working in the in these BBC studios on a, on a day to day basis. And it was always an effort to get people on air from remote locations um, or if we got them on air, it sounded terrible um, because I'm, you know, one of my. Um, one of the things that I like to hear is good quality audio uh, on broadcast platforms because, you know, scratch, nobody likes to hear uh, the sound of a, a scratchy telephone with wind blowing across the, the mouthpiece. Um, so th I, I set up this company as a small pilot project and I worked with the, the local university here in Manchester who were looking to build a remote studio at the time and they'd looked at ISDN and they'd looked at various solutions and I said there's got to be an easier way. Uh, so I started building, we started building uh, these remote contribution terminals which are essentially a computer with a microphone attached and a pair of headphones attached and I thought if we're going to do radio we might as well try to do television as well because you know um, data packets are data packets if you can send uh, audio then why not try and send video as well so we we tried to make it a video solution um so it's basically you've got a computer with these peripherals attached and then i looked at software which would achieve this um and protocols with which we could achieve this and we couldn't really find anything i say we i couldn't really find anything that was suitable for the job uh, and, and that was reliable and cost effective uh, and that's when i discovered webrtc just through internet searching um and was kind of blown away with the whole concept uh, of webrtc and i found the app rtc demo and uh, had a play with it with a, a colleague of mine from the BBC and yeah as I say was, was blown away with the potential for what this could do for broadcast and it, and it kind of it, it's grown from there to what it is now. So you say when you found WebRTC you were doing the hardware first um, I mean do pe let me ask this do people need hardware or do people come to you with their own hardware generally? Now, so the, so the business started out as a, a hardware solution um, because we there wasn't a, a user friendly solution that you could just you could just give them uh, to, to to set up themselves. I mean, from a video point of view and audio to an extent, you know, there's still a lot to go wrong. There's still a lot to get right, and we'd like to make the user experience much smoother. We're getting there with that, um, but. Uh, since we developed IPDTL, which is our WebRTC solution, uh, we've gone from being a, a, a very much a hardware provider to being very much a, a web application developer. Um, so we we don't we try our best not to get involved in in hardware at all now. Of course, you know we 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 do have to uh, involve ourselves in hardware. I naively, when I first discovered WebRTC, thought, wow, well this is easy. We just need a web server, um, and you know these are just two web pages, right? The two web pages will will just talk to each other, and we don't really need physical uh, hardware in between. You know we we learn very quickly that that wasn't the case and we now have hardware in various locations around the world so to say that we we have no hardware would would be disingenuous but we we are a um a web application developer now um rather than a hardware provider okay uh, that well that's outstanding and that certainly changes how the business works i mean now you can sell uh, as a service then uh, interconnectivity between facilities i i note um could you tell us something about sort of deployment i mean where are your customers and and describe them to us a little bit yeah 
Um, they are audio professionals, and uh, be that in the broadcast uh, area, so radio stations or uh, pro uh, pro professional audio studios uh, who are producing commercials or films um, or um, uh, videos for YouTube, which of course is a uh, uh, an ongoing, growing market, um, uh, or voice talent, voiceovers. We have, um, I would say, I deal mostly on a day-to-day -day basis with voice talent who um, traditionally have used ISDN audio codecs which is of course expensive and cumbersome and tied to the line and needs uh, a specific hardware codec at each end, um, but has, has been the workhorse for, for many years now. Um, so the, these voiceovers who use ISDN or traditionally have used ISDN at home um, now use solutions such as ours to, to work from their home studio to connect to the production studio, be that at a radio station or in a production house where they are making the aforementioned mentioned um, commercials, videos, and um, audio books is, is uh, also a, a massively growing market. Really? really, that's very interesting. That's very interesting. It, it's funny, as you just mentioned WebRTC a few moments ago, Tim Panton joined us. Hello, Tim. Thank you for, for taking the time to drop in. Uh, Tim has been one of the leading lights, certainly in our community, and web, all things WebRTC, and um, we're happy to have him join. Uh, speaking of that, what what was the development process like? Um, was it you know painless, painful? Was it a stumble or was it a, a straight shot to something deployable? I mean, what what was your experience getting started? I guess. Oh, it it was a steep learning curve. You know, it it was like that. So the I should I should mention Thomas here, who is my um, well business partner now, was a freelancer, and it was one of those very rare. Uh, Elance um, success stories, which might be un un unfair, you know, maybe other people have had better experiences uh, than I w with Elance, but this is, uh, a, you know, a match made in heaven um, uh, uh, from Elance, um, if you like. Uh, Thomas uh, was uh, a freelance uh, web developer, um, and uh, I really put put out the job on, on a whim, and uh, had one guy who who couldn't come up with the goods, and then Thomas came along, and he's an an absolute genius, and he is um, the driving force behind uh, IBDTL on the technical side. Um, you know, I have a, a vague uh, understanding of the uh, of the uh, IP side of things, but I'm more from I'm traditionally from an audio engineering or audio operations background. So uh, Thomas is really the the uh, the hidden face of IPDTL in terms of it, it wouldn't exist if, if it wasn't for him. Um, but between us, we had to learn uh, a lot. Uh, he he um, was aware of and had played with WebRTC, uh, but it was really, uh, he had to learn uh, WebRTC and all the various um, associated protocols from scratch. And we launched this product, I, sh I should say, we launched this product in three weeks from from me saying, is there somebody out here, out there who can build this? We launched it three weeks later, which looking back at how long it takes us to do do things now is, it, it's, it's unbelievable really that we managed that at the time. Now, when you say launched in three weeks, uh, does that mean you had a customer who was, you know, waiting breathlessly for for something they could use, or was it th th just the first offer? And then, how how did uptake go in those early days? We had a deadline. The reason, so what had happened? I should make mention of of V Line uh, here, who are a, a company in the states who I had approached because I'd seen that they were experimenting in the WebRTC field. And um, I approached VLINE and said, um, I, I'd played with their, their demo online, and I said, would it be possible to tweak this for broadcast? And they were uh, great at, um, at bringing together a very basic kind of working prototype, uh, which we did use um, on various BBC stations uh, successfully. Um, so we'd proved the concept concept with the help of V-Line uh, and then an opportunity to enter uh, the Technical Innovation Award in uh, November, the October, November 2013 came along. Uh, so I, I entered the award and then thought if I thought there is a chance we might win this. So if 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 there's a chance that we might win it, there'll be some publicity from this. 
and but I don't really have a product to push off the back of the publicity. So that's where the deadline came along. This three week deadline of I right, let's build this properly as something that we can market initially on a free basis, and then we very quickly started selling afterwards. Um, so that the uh, we did win. It's in fact, I, I thought it was over here, but I can't quite reach it. I, I we did win the award. It's just over there uh, to my right hand side, um, and. Off the back of that, the publicity that it generated, we wanted to have a product that we could launch. Uh, so that's where this ridiculous three-week deadline came along. And don't get me wrong, I mean, the product was really clunky and you could tell it was built by somebody who hadn't touched HTML for 10 years, which was which was me. Um, and uh, thankfully, Thomas was, uh, was more clued up in web design. And so we, we cobbled it together between us in three weeks. And since then, it, it's grown to, to be what it is now. So, OK, some specifics then. Uh, incidentally, for those who are uh, following the IRC, Thomas is in the IRC channel. And I know that he's listening or perhaps watching the YouTube feed. Um, uh, something technically then about, about the service. Uh, is it mono, stereo, full band, voice? I mean, what do you actually? What's the pitch to your customers? Audio is our main market. We added video almost just because we could and because there was the original, uh, the company, when, when I originally set it up, was supposed to be um, to serve both the audio and video or uh, you know, radio and TV markets. So we've added video, but our core market is, is definitely uh, on the audio and radio broadcasting uh, side of things. Uh, IPDTL. Uh, will provide uh, stereo streaming up to 320 kilobits per second. Um, most of our users use mono streams, uh, so two-way uh, mono streams uh, at around, well, let's say between 56 and, and 128 kilobits per second. Um, on top of that, we can do, uh, we've got HD video as well, uh, you know, uh, all imaginable resolutions and bit streams. Um, but for various reasons, you know, as I found out just just today, or as I re was reminded just today, video is adds in so many more complications, um, and that side of the product hasn't seen the growth that, that the audio side has. But that's that's basically it: two two way audio uh, streaming with video as an option uh, at high high bit rates. Um, speaking of those high bit rates, um, it was because there there are other other companies who are who have since launched similar products using. WebRTC, but we were first, and uh, it was us who asked the uh, WebRTC team to raise the minimum bit rate. That was one of the first hurdles that we faced. Uh, the minimum bit rate available for a WebRTC uh, Opus stream was 32 kilobits per second uh, plus overhead, which, um, of course, in the in the in the telecoms world, you would think, well, that's fine, isn't it? Um, and it, it took a little bit of pressure to, to convince the, the guys on the WebRTC team that it was that there was a, a, a good justification for from a pro audio point of view to, to raise these bit rates, um, so that we can now do these streams, which uh, I imagine are much uh, wider uh, bandwidth than, than what you're used to working generally uh, in the in the world of VoIP. Sorry, I'm I'm gonna diverge for a second because I'm I'm familiar with one other company in the space who's done something a little bit similar, but their claim to fame is is that they do direct integration with DAWs, um, the digital audio workstations. Is that something? I mean, in the space you're in, that seems kind of unrelated. That's more for you know musicians who are collaborating over IP or you know getting that after the fact guitar track done remotely, uh, not so much for voice. Do, do you see any demand for that kind of thing? You, you'd be surprised from a, a consumer or you know a prosumer point of view. Uh, we get asked almost on a daily basis, how do I integrate this with my DAW, which is, of course, d digital audio works, the workstation such as uh, Pro Tools or uh, Adobe Audition. Um, so it's I, I I would say I don't see the connection between the service that we provide and that because I see that as an audio routing or routing issue that you take the audio from your computer and you and you feed it as you wish into whatever device that you that you desire. Um, uh, Source Elements, who are the company who make Source Connect. 
um, who have also developed a, um, a similar streaming service to, to IPDTL. Their software, their traditional software, uh, Source Connect, does uh, does indeed use um, it, it doesn't it, you, you, it does integrate with Pro Tools, and I assume that's who you're who, who you're talking about. Um, now, from a kind of for somebody who isn't familiar with using um, with audio routing, then I, I guess that's that's a nice a nice little add on. Um, but I, I I kind of see it as it's not our job. Our job is to get the audio from A to B, not not for you to to get it from you know B to with being your computer, yeah. streaming computer uh, to to C being your recording computer, for instance. I, I I completely understand that, and there is sort of a question of of what's the role, what's the various parties' role in a particular production circumstance, and so it's good to be you know defined. Otherwise, you're it's not a turnkey solution for all things. Yeah, um, that said, and sorry, sorry to interrupt. We are very <laughs> excited and and uh, working as we speak on the web audio, uh, the, the web audio implementation in the browsers, um, which will give us the ability to capture incoming streams and rec rather than so that you won't even need to to interface with your DAW. Uh, you'll just click record in your browser and be able to capture that in an incoming stream. And that's pretty much there now. I don't know how much you guys have looked at that. Um, that's pretty much there now in, in the browsers, and it's something that we're hoping to implement uh, in the uh, well in, in the near-ish future. Um, there's a couple of questions coming out of the IRC channel. Um, uh, James has asked uh, specifically uh, a little bit about the hardware. I think what they're curious about is a sort of a profile of what's required to connect to the various other bits of your customer's installation. What, what's a typical sort of interface profile or, or connect scheme? Or, or if people wanted to buy your terminal box, tell us a little about that. Yeah, so just to be clear, um, our offering now is just is a, a subscription to our online okay. service, um, which we uh, we recommend um, is used on Chrome. It does work on uh, Opera um, and, and almost in Safari, but but not quite for, for various reasons. So we're not really pushing boxes now. But uh, in terms of the um, the hardware, uh, I'm talking to you right now on a Blue Yeti, which I imagine some of you are. Familiar familiar with it's a it's a USB microphone it's a it's a good quality condenser USB microphone uh, with a nice large diaphragm it comes in around the hundred bucks mark and uh, it is from a radio contribution point of view a, a great um, entry level USB microphone now from a voice talent point of view you probably want a, a more professional microphone than that and we recommend something such as the Focusrite 2i2, which is a, a Focusrite Scarlet 2i2, which is a USB interface. Um, again, everything's just just slightly out of reach uh, to me here. Uh, otherwise, I, I would hold it up to the camera. Um, but uh, yeah, the Focusrite 2i2 is a. Uh, in fact, let's just grab it. <laughs> it will it will mean just drifting off camera for a moment. It's just behind here. So and for the for the benefit of those who are watching while you're grabbing it, it it's a yeah. USB professional audio interface that has microphone preamps so you can plug you know, your favorite professional microphone as we see Randy using a Sennheiser 421 uh, so often uh, the black cigar like thing in front of Randy's face most days um, and then it gives you, you know, level control and allows the microphone to be brought into the computer as a digital stream Exactly that, and there you go. Sony uh, yet so far. Uh, so that is uh, a Focusrite 2i2, and on the front here, you've got uh, jack stroke XLR inputs, which are the standard microphone inputs. Um, you can add phantom power, which some high-end uh, microphones need. Um, headphone socket on the front as well, so you can hear the feed, the incoming feedback. Uh, and then on the back, you've got two jack outputs, uh, which will feed into your um, audio board or, uh, or mixing desk. And of course, it's it's a USB connection. So so yeah, that's for the, and again the, that comes in about the hundred bucks mark, and it's it really is a, a great a great bit of kit, and we're we're not on any any commission to say that. Actually, I it's on my list of things that I'm hoping for my birthday I'll be getting. Uh, I have a rather vintage little Soundcraft mixing board that I've been using, but bringing in uh, via other means, and I'm hoping to upgrade. Um, 
uh, Tim was was posing a question about the the audio bandwidth or or, um, or bit rate stuff. So stereo up to 320 kilobits. Um, what's your question, Tim, more specifically? Yeah, no, I was curious to know how how you manage that. Do you let it sort itself out what the connection can do, or or do you try and actively manage? or say, well, we're going to turn the knob up to. 200 today, or, or how does that play out for the user's perspective? We give the user the ability to to select their send quality. So I'll, this is probably a good op opportunity to to show you the interface. So uh, so let's do that. Um, if I share my screen with you here, um, and you can confirm whether or not you're seeing that. Not Maybe yet. I've got one. I've got one more click to go. There you go. There we go. Cool. Yeah, there we are. Um, so this is our uh, our main uh, browser interface uh, at PHP, and you can see we've got a nice little send level mixer here, uh, which uh, you, you can monitor to check that you're not sending too high or too low. Um, we've got a little. It's kind of this is a bit of a novelty, really, but it's got uh, a, an audio send mixer. Uh, we could bring in a, a second interface. Um, so that you, you could fade up an additional source, so, you, so you're fading in two sources. You can load in an audio file uh, and uh, bring that in here. Um, but to answer, to, to go back to your question, and we can look at the interfaces as, as mu in as much detail as you like as, as we go on. Um, we've got these uh, send quality drop downs here, so it's. It, this selecting on here um, affects the uh, the send stream. So each user selects what they send uh, to the remote user, and it, we can go down as low as, as 32 kilobits per second mono uh, and up to, to 320 stereo. So the thinking there is that the the user has the the greatest understanding. Of course, it's not always the case, but the idea is that the user has the greatest understanding about their uh, available um, bandwidth. But we we do, as you'll see above here, have a, a bandwidth test which will measure the uh, the available bandwidth uh, on. The um, uh, which should be an indication, and then actually, oh well, in fact, it, it actually, you know, I, I forget about some of these features myself. You can see that um, we have a, a red color for um, the bit rates that we wouldn't recommend so much based on the the bandwidth test when you load the browser. Okay, I'm not. We're not actually seeing that uh, in terms of audio send quality. I still see the 64-bit mono. Right. Um, um, I. I. But if uh, are you seeing my mouse move around? No. Right. Okay. So I guess I guess the screen sharing isn't yeah, isn't yeah, updating. Yeah. We're seeing it here. Uh, right. Know. Okay. Excellent. Fine. Okay, that's good. Cool. So, so yeah, you can you can select your what you wish to send, and there is a guidance. The the ready orangey color is is to su suggest that you might not want to think about using that uh, bit rate. But of course, you know it's very difficult to to predict how far you can push um, any any given internet connection, and of you know it's, the situation is constantly fluctuating. So, Kevin, mm. what kind of algorithm are you using to ascertain the quality of the bandwidth? That's a question for Thomas. I, I'll allow him to uh, to type me an answer that, I, that I'll read out. <laughs> Thomas is very is very microphone and and, and camera shy, um, so he's very happy for me to uh, to do all the talking in these situations. But uh, but often uh, he has he has such answers. Um, uh, I mean, I'll I'll show you it. I'll show you it working whilst whilst we wait for that. There's a little refresh button on there. Um, and uh, I mean, actually, I tell you what we'll do. Let's load the uh, console as well, and uh, you'll sure. see it going uh, in the console. Um, so if I if I load the console there, and then uh, and then hit the bandwidth test. So you can see uh, that we we're sending payloads to several of our servers, um, and it will take an average of. Uh, this is my limited understanding. It will take an average of of each of those tests and give you uh, and give you a result in in terms of stars and uh, and in uh, in terms of numbers. So, um, though you might find that the console output there probably answers the question uh, better than any anything I can say. It does. Interesting. Interesting. Um, and uh, from a, an end end user's point of view, 
I mean, you have the voice talent there, your customer, and then you have their customer who might be the production company or the facility. Um, has has acceptance been, I mean, uh, is, is this good enough? Do, do people, if they have a grasp of their hardware and their IP connection is good, uh, are the broadcasters, you know, thumbs up, or is there anybody questioning? Still, oh, absolutely. Uh, there's um, there's a huge um, resistance uh, in the broadcast industry. Uh, oh, uh, just before I answer that question, shall I just, uh, let me just read out what Thomas has written here. Uh, he's, he says, we're, we're sending blobs to our WebSocket servers. Uh, there's a first payload to get past TCP slow start and to make it more accurate. It remains an, an approximation, but it's good enough for our purposes. Um, it, it, does anybody want to respond to that or shall I continue? Thank you, with, Thomas. With That's answer? exactly what I wanted to know and exactly how I would have done it if I was doing it. So thank you. It's always reassuring to to know that the the people you've got on the job are uh, are, are, do, are doing things um, uh, as as well as other other professionals would would expect. Um, so so it's, sorry. So, so to go back, your your next question was about that acceptance in the industry, um, and the yeah, there, there's definitely a, a reluctance to switch to any kind of uh, IP technologies in the audio professional and broadcast sector um, mostly due to a lack of understanding uh, I would say um, as to you know people will say oh yeah I used the internet once it wasn't very good <laughs> you know that's the kind of that's the kind of argument that we, that we hear, hear about and then you say well where did you use the internet they'll say well it was in a you know a, a, an internet cafe in in a remote village in Africa I was like yeah well that's that's why it wasn't it wasn't very good um, so there's, I think there's a lot of educating to do to prove to people that uh, the internet and indeed um, IP, um, you know, other other methods of IP uh, communication are reliable enough for um, critical applications such as broadcast streaming. But uh, to to continue to answer your question. We now have clients at most of the major uh, broadcasters, broadcasters around the world. Most of the major audio studios around the world are using uh, a, a, a mixture of IPDTL uh, and Source Connect and uh, and still ISDN. So yes, there's an acceptance, but we've got a way to go. You know, we've we've still got a lot of a lot of work to do in convincing at least some people, maybe some of the old school engineers, um, that uh, that. IP is and, and indeed our IP solution is a viable alternative to uh, you know the dinosaur uh, that is ISDN. Well, I, I you know I was when I was sort of researching and stumbled across you guys. I looked at um, your website and it, it it geolocated me to Houston, and then it pointed out all of the different voice talent and studios that were uh, had accounts that were ready to to be contribution points if I wanted to go and you know be interviewed on the BBC, heaven forbid, um, or whomever else. And there were in the Houston area there were a dozen, um, which kind of surprised me. So how, how does it break down customer distribution wise? You, Europe, the UK, the US. Is there a particular sort of trend or the U.S. I mean, obviously, we're a U.K. company, and we started off in um, in the U.K. Uh, but the U.S. is now our biggest market, uh, mostly you know due to its size and population, I, I would say, but also due to the. Um, I think the telcos, of, of which of course there are many uh, across the United States, the telcos are more keen to switch off the traditional ISDN circuitry um, in uh, in the US than they are in Europe. Uh, we BT here in the UK uh, have the latest date that they've said is uh, 2025. I'm sure there are you know many of you have, have heard other conflicting uh, reports, um, but in the states there are, there are certain towns in the states where they've just turned off ISDN and said you know if if the ISDN uh, switch in a local exchange fails then these telcos are just saying we, we just we're not going to bother replacing it and so our clients and potential clients have come up against that and therefore um, come to us uh, as a solution so I think that's part of the reason for our growth in in the states is due to the uh, the fall in availability uh, of uh, of ISDN and you know the telcos. Well, to go back to the original point uh, at, the, at the start of this uh, webcast, um, the telcos 
aren't interested in selling ISDN. Um, they, you know, a lot of, we, we, because we've had to, I mean, I, we can come on to this. We recently have had to, ironically, have had to provision ISDN circuits both here in the UK and in the States because we have um, reverse engineered IPDTL now to be able to connect uh, with ISDN. And in order to do that, we had to um, provision or have provisioned um, traditional ISDN circuits. And the first salespeople that we spoke to had no idea what it was. Um, so, yeah, I, therefore, I suppose the simple answer to the question is um, the United States is our biggest market, um, closely followed by the UK and, and the wider Europe. I, I, have a, I have a quick question on the ISDN front. Did you end up getting an ISDN 30 or or, 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 or a bunch of uh, basic rate, rate ISDN? Uh, they're all basic rate, and uh, as we... As we expand, if indeed we need to expand the ISDN side of things, we might go back and, you know, this is where a, um, a, a web chat such as this potentially comes in handy because it might be that some of you guys have got some uh, some great ideas as, as to how we can achieve this on scale differently to, to how we have. Um, we couldn't find the right uh, hardware solution uh, to connect to a, a primary rate uh, inter interface um, uh, ISDN 30. So uh, we've got a, a whole load of BRIs both uh, here in the UK uh, and in the States with uh, it, hardware uh, attached to each individual line. Okay, cool. No, we could um, we could certainly come up with ideas about how you could do that with. Uh, with ISDN 30, I think some of us have got ISDN 30 in our in our um, history. Let's say. Um, well, that's yeah, that's yeah. good to know, and I and I suppose the key thing for us is um, is the various flavors of codec um, which which are used, and whether uh, there are solutions or, or a solution could be built that would that would um, uh, that could handle codec such as MPEG Layer Two and uh, AAC, uh, as well as um, G seven two two, which is obviously uh, more common in the telephony world. So, Tim, a question for you, because I'm in the U.S. here, and I don't understand ISDN 30. I do understand a PRI, or what we call a T1. Yeah, same thing, essentially. It, it, okay. except that, it, so it's a PRI with a specific... Um, so you you guys run it... Oh, you run a PRI what, with... 1.544 yeah, or something. With fewer channels. It's like 24 channels. 20, 24, cha 24 channels, yeah. Right, well... Uh, well in the US, in the UK, it would be a two megabit circuit running thirty ISDN channels at sixty four kilobit each, whereas in the US it would be twenty four at fifty six kilobits each. Right, and and we we refer to that as an E one, right? Because it's sort of the, the European standard. So the, so the problem with the E one is E one doesn't necessarily, I think, tell you what you're going to run over it. So, oh, okay. in theory, you could have an E1 and then run IP over it, I think. I mean, it's a, it, it is now 15 years since I ordered the uh, ISDN 30, so it, you know, uh, I've forgotten a great deal about this stuff, uh, and gladly so, actually, I should add. TDM networks, nasty things. Let's be real. Yeah, nasty things. Uh, uh, except for the latency. Yeah, well, and it's predictable. Moving forward, Kevin, um, what about mobile devices? I, I, I'm guessing that your whole focus is on the fixed studio, but are you doing anything for people who go out and about on the ground? Or, or, or I'm guessing that your product probably does that if you've got enough bandwidth. Yeah, it's it's something that we've looked at. We haven't talked um, about. Um, the, the consistency of packet delivery yet. And uh, I, mean, I think for the average VoIP solution, you can get away with a certain amount of, uh, of jitter. Um, but for a, a pro audio application such as ours, um, having those 
um, packets arrive. Firstly, every single packet arrive, but also arriving in, in the right order is, is massively important to us. Chrome's error correction is is reasonable, but it's it can only do so much. Um, so that's why, from I mean, from a personal point of view, I'm a big fan of a computer with an Ethernet cable um, connected to it because uh, you're you're removing the vagaries of, of Wi-Fi as soon as you go onto um, well, yeah, Wi-Fi on mobile devices, let alone um, mobile broadband then you run, of course, into um, much higher, um, or, or the potential uh, for much higher jitter well, that, uh, and well, packet that's loss. True. That's true, but only if you use domestic cooking grade um, quality of service. Uh, one of the great things about LTE is that you can define the quality of service that you, you want, and you pay a bit more. It's a bit, bit like uh, going to, um, to ISDN. You pay a bit more for the quality of service, but you get a really good quality, low latency, uh, next to no jitter uh, type circuit uh, at the expense of everybody else who uh, does cooking grade. Absolutely, and I think some of our larger clients would be interested and are interested in, in that kind of service. Um, most of our users um, are journalists in the field and um, and indeed uh, voice voice talent who are using domestic connections in the home. Um, so that's that's what we're up against um in that certainly you know if you're a journalist in the field you use whatever um connectivity you have available uh, it, it may it may be as you say that the lte is uh, is a solution for somebody in that in that situation uh, if they can if they can um if such a service is a, a available uh, b mm. proves to be reliable the only person in this conference oops yeah. um yeah well they are becoming available um one of the problems with with, with lte services is, is that each Big MNO initially has set up their own um, their own flavour of it, so it's it's kind of a bit like the early days of mobile, where uh, at first there was no roaming, uh, and then people got their acts together and sorted out the roaming. We're 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 only just today this year getting international LTE roaming um, going. Uh, we've now got it in uh, USA, um, Spain. Um, Poland, a couple of other countries, but it, it, it takes a lot of time uh, because it's all new, and uh, and different countries operate on different standards. I, I I don't know whether you know about the differences between ITU and ANSI signaling. Trying to get things in and out of North America, for example, is uh, is more difficult than getting it in and out of uh, Afghanistan. Because of, the, because of the differences in signalling, so I'd be I'd be very uh, very interested to learn about uh, to learn more about um, yeah that kind of um, service guarantee um, for mobile. Um, in the back of my mind, I, I, I'm thinking you know I'll, well I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> I think you know well, the it, proof it, of, the, it, of, of the of the of the pudding will be in the eating. Um, yeah, I've I found with mobile and Wi-Fi that. Um, um, interference, especially in big cities, um, is is a major issue. But you know, I I'll, I'd love you to prove to prove me uh, to to prove that it's a it's a workable solution. Well, I think we'll just show you. And, and just on going, coming back to Wi-Fi, there's a lot you can do with just plain old vanilla uh, DSCP uh, diff diff serve the differentiated services. If you just change the um, the precedence, um, the tagging. On your DSCP headers, you can do a lot of good. All your real-time traffic goes to the front of the queue, and that works in what 95, 98 percent of scenarios. And people just got no idea about that. It's sitting there in your headers, and if you don't touch it, you you don't get any improvements. James, you'll have to stop. Well, there's 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 on certainly this. a lot of education to be had. I think, yeah, for, certainly from our. I mean, as I say, you know, we're learning all the time on this, and our. Uh, our users are learning all the time on this, and we're trying to educate them as as we learn, pass on pass on what we know to our users. But yeah, I mean, um, it, it would be it, it sounds like there are discussions to be had um, about how we can uh, exploit uh, such uh, such possibilities. Yeah. The dark arts. Yeah, so you might you might appreciate that some of this crowd uh, exists in in uh, technology space and not in user space. Absolutely. And uh, and and, and uh, you know, my 
professional life has spent bridging those two universes, um, which is always interesting. Uh, customers are customers they educate us or they force us to educate ourselves. I should say you have some very good testimonials on your on your website. There seem to be a lot of people um, who really like the service. Uh, th one of the things I've experienced the intransigence of, of broadcasters who you know don't want to the devil they know I suppose is the way it works. Um, but I think the big opportunity they're missing is well that might be convenient. You have I think in what you offer the opportunity to do much better than they're accustomed to. Um, is that has that been your experience? Are they trying just to achieve equal, or or do they ac appreciate better when they can get it? It it really is old habits. Um, I think you know they have a solution uh, in ISDN which currently works, and although they're they're is a movement or there are movements within broadcast organizations to uh, to change i mean the bbc does an awful lot of its um remote contributions now over ip um internally but it, a lot of the external contributions of the bbc and indeed internal contributions are still done over isdn because there there isn't the um ISDN is a known quantity, and uh, and the various IP solutions um, aren't so known. You know, I, I, IPDTL, our product, is becoming more and more known, you know, as uh, has become more and more known over the last few years, and I hope that will continue to grow so that radio producers, etc., um, are, are, are far more familiar with the technology because it's really just, it's it's a lack of, um, it's a lack of appreciation, really, and, a, and a, probably a fear of the unknown. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, there's the flexibility of the service that we offer is, you know, it's far more flexible than ISDN. But of course, it's it comes back to the kind of training and education um, because it can be used on, you know, domestic Wi-Fi, for instance, then uh, there's the potential for it to go wrong um, in a in a in a more elaborate, you know, it, 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 to fail more cata more catastrophically than uh, an ISDN with a, a fixed cable into uh, into a port. Um, now, if nobody's got anything, if anybody's got anything to add to that, uh, go ahead. Otherwise, I'll just go back and make a further point about mobile. Well, well there, yeah. there was one point I, I wanted to make here, uh, and and that was that you're going to meet surely an awful lot of resistance, uh, actually, from the people who have to use the kit out in the field. Um, it, it just putting my, in my own experience hat on here, from the point of local. Uh, radio stations football commentaries I know a few of the commentators and I've had to deal with them on a technical basis with their kit and basically if they can't plug it in and, and switch it on and immediately talk to someone they are complete that's, that's it they're lost absolutely yeah that's the level of uh, expertise that we're dealing with here and the, the level of patience um, meanwhile, you know, I the the BBC called me today and asked if um, there was any way they could get um, a contributor in um, the outskirts of London on air um, this afternoon, and in fact, it's happening in in the next hour. Um, and what we sometimes do is try and send somebody to their house with kit, but we couldn't do that today. So I I called the the contributor and had them um, install Chrome on their MacBook because they didn't have Chrome on their MacBook, disable the um, uh, uh, the noise reduction on their built-in microphone, find some headphones, um, log into IPDTL, um, position their voice appropriately to the microphone, and they will be appearing on a BBC national station in the next hour um, with with that um, with that equipment. So. It, it goes to show, you know, you can you can teach, and this was somebody who wasn't, you know, particularly technically competent. But it goes to show you can teach an old dog uh, new tricks, and that's what we need to do here. But at the same time, we need to keep making our user experience easier. Um, so you know, it really it, there are all sorts of um, hurdles, as you're aware at the moment, to get over with a piece of analog equipment. You can dial the ISDN call and then plug the microphone in. Well, you can't do that with a USB uh, microphone. You can't connect your your IP um, WebRTC stream because there's no audio source there. So there's 
trying to trying to teach people these new ways of working and how um, you can't use a, a device which the web page can't see yet because you you've loaded the web page before you've plugged the microphone in. You, there, there are quite a, uh, there's there's quite a journey to go on in terms of the education there. Yeah, yeah. That, that's that's a fact, and we we see that um, um, around ZipDX. We see this in some of our businesses uh, where you know we have a web based uh, way of accessing a telephone call, and and uh, sometimes giving people whose let's just say their strengths are in other areas to uh, to use what we think of as very simple tools requires a lot of handholding which which leads to a question of sort of scalability you you make things as simple as you can so that it's as easy as it as it can be to make your customers productive with as little effort on your part uh, or you end up sort of charging lots of consultancy and onboarding fees and things like that so so what's the future as we as we are 10 minutes to the top of the hour what what's the future what's the go ahead plan for for IPDTL I hadn't realized how the time had flown. It just goes to show how, how much uh, we can talk. Um, so, th so our current project, or our recent project, has been um, rolling out this, this ISDN connectivity, um, the, the backwards compatibility, and we're continuing to look at how we can make that more flexible. Um, one thing, you know, the, one of the uh, benefits of being on a web chat such as this is to, is to tap into the expertise of, of the people who are watching. And one thing we've been looking at recently is how how um, we could possibly give our users uh, and their own ISDN number, uh, their own ISDN numbers that people could dial into our service on, and we've we've kind of drawn a blank with that at the moment. So that's just a, I'll just plant that seed there, um, and uh, and I'll also plant the seed of. Um, we, we touched on mobile and as we know webrtc and ios um uh, aren't really compatible at, at this stage so we'd love to have uh, ibdtl on an ios app we we've looked at sip apps um <laughs> Which don't really, they, they take a bit too much configuration really for, uh, we, we really need more of a zero configuration option for our users um, to, to be able to connect with uh, IPDTL from iOS and um, uh, and with with ideally the Opus codec, which obviously uh, gives a, the, uh, the a high a, a far higher uh, standard of audio quality. So there's just a few, a few things that I'll put out there. If anybody has any uh, ideas on uh, on on how we might offer that or that how they might help us, then do do get in touch on that. Um, uh, so, this, so those are things that we're looking at. I, I think at the moment our our main focus is on the the web audio side of things. So we're looking at capturing streams in the browser um, so that we can. We've got. Uh, I showed you earlier our virtual mixer in the browser. We'd love as we'd love to make that much more elaborate so that you can. So it, you, you have a virtual studio in your browser. Um, you capture the incoming streams and uh and can possibly edit them in the browser as well you know the with web audio brings uh all those possibilities um thomas also uh raises a note here about um um Oh, uh, free switch. He, he, uh, he, he just says that we should, um, he, or he, he raises the point that it's worth mentioning um, free switch. And I'm kind of rambling here, but I see yeah. the time's, well, <laughs> time's I, running I out. I we... the same thing. I was going to go, mm. free, free, free switch. Uh, Thomas, <laughs> yes, we're we, sh we should to kidnap Thomas and drag him over to Chicago with us in August because that's where it all happens. And I'm Absolutely. sure uh, he would come back with lots of solutions. Um, can I just drag you very quickly back to the, um, the, the robustness and scalability type thing that you mentioned earlier? Um, there is no doubt whatsoever in my mind that once you've sorted out the front end and the, um, the, the customer facing bit of modern WebRTC type apps, the performance and robustness is going to be much, much, much better than your ISDN ever was. Uh, and there are things like um, the, the G711 PCM um, codec um, will uh, crack up at around half a percent packet, quarter to half a percent packet loss. Um, last year, we were demonstrating the Opus codec working reasonably well at 
fifty percent, five zero, fifty percent packet loss. So uh, if you if you select the right technology in your codec um, part, uh, oh, another thing, you, um, you, you can be very robust. Another thing you've got to watch out for, by the way, is transcoding. Um, and if you get your transcoding wrong, then you will you will sound really awful. So um, yeah, you just have to be a bit careful. Um, but you're in a good position to do that because um, you can control the choice of codec and you can control the the transcoding um, as part of your service to protect the poor broadcasters who probably are unaware of what's going on and really don't want to know. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and we've, you, I, I suppose that, that that does tie in neatly with uh, with with free switch. You, you know, I I think the point was that we wanted to. Uh, Make a point here that we've um, we're eternally grateful to the Free Switch team for the for the help that we've received in because Free Switch does sit in between um, IPDTL the, on the Chrome side and our ISDN hardware. Um, it's Free Switch that, that does some of the magic in the middle there, along with some proprietary stuff. And um, we, yeah, we we had uh, we had a fair bit of help from the Free Switch team on the. Um, well, you're you're going to have to join us. In Chicago at Glucon in August, that's the that's the obvious thing to do. Let's it does sound it does we'll sound like the obvious now. thing to so do. Glucon August. August. I'm writing. I'm writing it down. August. August. Glucon. It's first first week in August or second week around. Cool. Then. No, we'd we'd love to join you. I mean, obviously for a, a, a startup of our size, um, you know, budgets are tight, but um, but we'd we'd absolutely love to look at the possibility. Well, yeah, well worth the uh, the investment, I think. And um, there's a chance that I will be making it to Klucon this year. I oh, really, Michael? Yes. It's you really do need to get out out of that office more. Um, I like my one, office. I know, I know you love your office, but but we like to see you face to face. So, all right. Any last questions out of IRC? Um, we've we've, as they say on NPR. Car talk. We've wasted another perfectly good hour chatting about things, IP communications and such. Um, it's we're fortunate that we are able to assemble both interesting guests with great new startup business ideas and also a panel of technologists without compare. Um, so, Randy, are you there, buddy? How's the Facebook stream been going? Let's let's get to the back of this and see because this has been an experiment just so that we put this in the recording we've been trying to stream to Facebook live video which I'm not sure how successful that was uh, but. I think everything's <laughs> well we'll we'll do a post-mortem afterwards it was working it's oops that's one of the great <laughs> things about the piece it's working. is it, it's different every week and and sometimes it works really well and sometimes it works slightly less well but that's how no, we it's learn. Still, it's still working. It's just that I'm out of sync. So I'm hearing myself like 30 seconds later. So okay, let's let's wrap up the official part of this, and we'll go on to the adults only part. Thank you, Kevin, for taking the time to come and talk to us. Um, the IP address, or the IP address, no, the uh, the website is ipdtl.com for anybody who's interested. I specifically reached out to our good friend. Um, voice gal, Allison Smith, who is the leading voice talent for uh, telecom PBX IVR systems and interactive um, recordings and such. And uh, she was quite enthusiastic and said that she spent a considerable effort avoiding ISDN. Uh, and in fact, her home studio in Edmonton, Canada was not ISDN equipped and uh, she was going to look into your wares. Um, Great. Any last, any last thing you'd like to say or will you be appearing at any trade shows that you'd like to, to notify people of? Or yeah, apart like from Google. Nothing in the, in the near future. Um, we, again, you know, as a, as a small startup, you know, one of the reasons we've been able to do so much is uh, because we're very good at offering, uh, operating on a, on a shoestring. But of course, um, trade shows and international flights and, and hotels and things um, quickly eat into the budget. So uh, although we, we did the NAB show in Vegas, 
Vegas um, almost well, yeah, two years ago. Um, yet no no plans in the near future. But we, I mean, we'd love to come and, and see you guys uh, at more of these events um, if the opportunity arises. I, I should say I, I worked eighteen NABs in a row, and that is a way to spend money. Absolutely. Uh, it surely is. Well, thanks again. We will wind this down unless there's one last call out for questions. Yes, James Bodie, you're a mic slapper. Well, okay, we'll get over that. <laughs> thanks, Kevin and Randy. Can we wind down? <laughs>